Hi everyone, I'm George Farrar. Welcome to Jax 94, Jacksonville as it was in the year 1994. So in the early days of 1994, it was time to demolish almost all of the Gator Bowl. And it was time for Jacksonville to build an NFL stadium, which would initially be named Jacksonville Municipal Stadium. Of course, we would know it later by all the corporate names that were put on it uh, from time to time uh, changing. But isn't it amazing to see this accomplishment uh, happening for Jacksonville, uh, a big thing happening? But construction of this stadium was not the only big thing that was happening in Jacksonville. In 1994, a grand jury came back with recommendations that uh, the uh, officers in the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office have a minimum education of an associate's degree in community college. So, uh, so it's interesting to see kind of the perspective of it. Here we see an Ed Gamble uh, political cartoon with the state attorney, Harry Shorstein, pulling over Sheriff Jim McMillan. Uh, and so I actually met Harry Shorstein in the lobby uh, of the uh, FCCJ downtown campus. Uh, we now know it, of course, as Florida State College at Jacksonville. I met him briefly and shook his hand. Uh, I was uh, intrigued by what was going on because the grand jury was basically saying, listen, we know most of uh, the officers are doing the right thing, but there are problems, and there are things that can make things things that can be done that can make things better. There were calls for reform, and one of the to this day uh, institutions in publishing out there uh, for Jacksonville has been uh, the Folio Weekly, and uh, I remember at Community College in December of 1994 uh, in the cafeteria at the Kent campus reading this this article about the state of the JSO and about, um, it's interesting because you see a picture of Nat Glover and we know uh, what the future will hold uh, for Jacksonville. And so this is a very amazing time. And uh, you got the feeling that things were going to be changing, right? That things were going to be progressing. So in 1994, the president of the United States of America was Bill Clinton. In 1994, the governor of Florida was Walton Childs, and in 1994, the mayor of Jacksonville was Ed Austin. And the interesting thing about Ed Austin, two interesting things about Ed Austin, he changes his political party affiliation as mayor from Democrat to Republican. There's a story that he's going to get on a plane to go to China for a trade meeting. And he is afraid that if the plane goes down, it'll list him as Ed Austin, Democrat. And so he changes political parties. He becomes a Republican. Uh, and that's an interesting realignment. And then he doesn't run for mayor of Jacksonville for a second term. Of course, we'll talk extensively about the 1995 mayoral election in Jax 95. Now, there was an election in 1994 for various national, state, and local uh, positions, and there were also, I believe, uh, some amendments. Uh, I only am showing you a portion of the results uh, for the Duval County general election. It was the first election I voted in. Okay, I was so young, I was so, I was so different back then, uh, and I voted for Connie Mack for U.S. Senate. Uh, <laughs> I saw his TV ad, and I thought he'd be a great guy, and I voted for him. And he was the first uh, candidate I ever voted for in an election, top of the ballot. And uh, I, I voted, uh, and uh, it's kind of interesting you look back at the different people that were in office at that time. Now, as promised, I'm going to talk with you in a comprehensive way about the Jacksonville River City Renaissance Urban Renewal Plan we're talking approximately $235 million borrowed uh, and uh, something that came through from the city council. It was a big initiative out of the Ed Austin administration. If you want to look at what an Ed Austin legacy was, and really if you look at what a John Delaney legacy is, really, when you look at it, uh, 
that would be River City Renaissance. And there was a lot that's to it. There was a lot of good, okay? I want to start from the outset to say that there was a lot of good that resulted. A lot of improvement, I believe, in the overall quality of life of the city, of which there needed to be a boost. And I'm going to explain that to you, but I am I'm going to first start talking with you about La Villa, because this is where some things went wrong. Residential is important in an inner city. Uh, La Villa has a rich, amazing history of which I did a show about uh, that's on the Jack's Life channel. Various uh, places, including the Ritz uh, Performing Arts Center and Museum, uh, various websites have a, a really uh, great history, better history than I could ever tell you about the African American heritage in the area, in the, in the heights of um, the 1930s and 1940s and before even. And we're talking about an area that was encompassed by, not that far from, uh, the uh, Acosta Bridge Union Station, uh, which was a railroad terminal from 1919 until 1974. Uh, easy access right into downtown. Okay, so you're looking at a lot of houses. So a lot of them in, the, in what you might call shotgun house style. Okay, I remember as a youngster, First memories of Jacksonville, going right by La Villa on the Union State Street corridor, okay? The picture you're looking at here would be, I would say, around the time of the 1940s. And my memories uh, of La Villa uh, are from the early 1980s and then into the 1990s. And it said with the shotgun house that uh, you could... Um, point a gun and fire a bullet from the back of the house uh, through an open door from the back of the house and it would go out the front door. The idea back in those days, these houses were built for air circulation. There was no mass air conditioning, okay? Uh, no big AC unit when it hit 90 degrees or something during the day. Uh, so it was a whole different way of living and it was a very big entertainment district for African Americans. Ray Charles uh, performed a uh, piano at the Ritz Theater. Okay, the Ritz Theater was built in 1929. So there was a lot of things that were going on in the 1930s and the 1940s. And there were, there was a point where the city wanted to recognize this and possibly get some development, get some business development to celebrate the history, the musical heritage of the area uh, and to draw visitors, right? So, uh, if you go back and you look at the different histories, different some of the different stories, it's it's just it's amazing, it's intriguing to read about the people who live there because you had people that were servicing downtown, they were servicing Union Station when it was an active railroad terminal, okay? But all of this is going to start to get wiped away because guess what? There is going to be a massive boom in population. People are going to be getting in their cars and they have to be able to get around and about the city and they've decided in the 1950s to create something called the Jacksonville Expressway Authority. They uh, used tolls and borrowing to build huge uh, expressways. Uh, we get things like the Arlington Expressway. We get the start of Interstate 95 uh, and Interstate 10. Uh, we get, uh, when you look at it, with all of this development and construction, we see that they're going through and they rip through uh, the areas of, these would be ripping through areas of La Villa, Brooklyn, through the north side, uh, and uh, through the west side, uh, through the south side, uh, to build these huge, uh, what would become Interstates 95, Interstate 10. Uh, and it's going to be phenomenal, and it's going to happen in a very short period of time. We're talking about the 1950s into the early 1960s. By the mid-1960s, you've got this huge uh, expressway system all over the city, people going through toll booths, stopping to pay their tolls at various uh, places, and it really changes the dynamic of the city. We get the Fuller Warren Bridge, which starts out as a Gilmore Street Bridge, gets hooked into I-95, and as they say, the rest is history. And so it, with a lot of these kinds of disruptions, whether it's an economic disruption, as the travel modes change, uh, as, or whether there's a development disruption as 
Uh, people begin to move to different areas. With integration, people uh, will move uh, to uh, uh, other neighborhoods. Uh, so uh, time after time, uh, there's migration that happens. And so we have all of this that's going on, uh, and it impacts uh, the city greatly, and it impacts the people of Bovilla uh, particularly not far from all of this, basically really the epicenter of the development and the, basically the destruction that enables the development. Okay, so there's a story, there are stories to be found out about, and there's stories to understand about what exactly happened in the 1950s and 1960s. And, and so there's this big urban boom that's happening. We, we lose the, the shipyards bit year by year, fewer and fewer shipyards, more and more skyscrapers, office buildings, commercial warehouses, parking lots, stores. Uh, we're going to start getting an amazing amount of development in the late 1950s, early 1960s, as all of this is going on. I mean, we're talking massive construction. And so you can see from here, we see the Prudential uh, building on the South Bank. On the North Bank, we see the Atlantic Coast uh, Railroad building, uh, which will later on become the Seaboard Coastline building, to later become the CSX building. We see in the distance a little bit there, we see the Sears. We see where eventually uh, the uh, what would be the Independent Life uh, building, Wells Fargo building, some people may know it's the Modus building. Uh, we would see, uh, we'll eventually see that uh, constructed in the 1970s. So there's all of this going on. And, and to the north, we can see Interstate uh, 95. And we can see it as it cuts down uh, to the west, uh, basically you could say to the southwest, towards uh, uh, aligning right along. As part of this, Jacksonville gets a civic center in the 1950s, the, the, uh, what would then be the uh, Duval County Courthouse on the river, and the Jacksonville City Hall on the river is dedicated in 1960. So, uh, and of course, both of these structures uh, were demolished uh, later on. But the city is really setting its uh, mark uh, out there. Uh, and so there's just so much construction there's so much spending. There's so much that's happening in 1960 something, okay? And but there's there are people that are negatively impacted by this. Uh, these would be people in the older neighborhoods, right? Who, as all of this is progressing, are not getting their basic um, infrastructure needs met, maintained, because. Again, dynamics change. And there's a lot of hoopla with big city projects. And these politicians back then, as today, really love to have a big show to, to, to show off what has been done. And we will keep in mind that, of course, one of the big features of the River City Renaissance plan was a uh, basically a new city hall uh, in a renovated historic building. Now, another uh, thing that came along in 1960 was the Jacksonville Coliseum. Now, there is a place that I've profiled and talked about many times uh, on uh, uh, in my various history shows. And so, uh, it, it, the city sought at that point to be able to provide in a common way to, to generally to everybody to be able to converge upon the city and enjoy a lot of the entertainment. It is important to remember that at this point, it will take a couple more years into the 1960s for desegregation to finally come to the city. And it's important to keep in mind uh, what was happening in the 1950s and 1960s as it related to civil rights because that has an impact on development, migration, neighborhoods. Because as people can celebrate more together as a people of Jacksonville and not segregated uh, by race, into you go here, you go there, you stay here, you stay there. Never the two shall meet if we say they shan't. Those times were going away. And we see a beautiful picture here, a zoom in. We see, we look at it, we've got the Atlantic Coastline Railroad building uh, constructed around the early 1960s. We have the Civic Auditorium constructed around 1962. Behind it, we have the Sears 
uh, store, which uh, was constructed around 1959, uh, behind it. And the Sears was huge. I remember visiting in the late 70s or early 80s as a very young youngster. And, uh, and I have a couple great memories of that place. And, and behind it, you see the Hotel Mayflower, which was demolished. Directly behind the Hotel Mayflower, you see where it says the Hotel George Washington. That was demolished as well. Okay, uh, later on, the Robert Meyer Hotel further back would be demolished. So a lot of things, some things stay, some things go. Now, of course, how can I forget the Civic Auditorium? I saw many, a, uh, went to many a, um, a ballet performance, concert performance uh, at the Civic Auditorium, where, of course, I was on my best behavior. <laughs> you, how can anyone ever forget the many field trips to the Civic Auditorium? And, and the unique experience you have, you pull up to this in a bus, this place in a bus, and you get off and you go in and, and you experience this, you know, some culture, great cultural moments, great cultural things, things that are greater than yourself, because, hey, what are you, you're just some kid off a school bus from some school, and you've been brought downtown, and, you know, your parents are at work, and you're sitting there watching ballet, right? Okay, so, now, it was time, by the 1990s, for this building built in the 1960s people felt to be renovated uh there were always complaints you'd hear complaints about the coliseum you hear complaints about the civic auditorium uh, about acoustics and what could possibly be done for venue for it to be a good venue for people to come and really have a good time and really perform and bring in the good the big shows that maybe some of your more socialite more culturally adept people they want to go for and and certainly, you have some splash over effect with young people, right? So, the, again, we're talking about what is, can people enjoy in common, right? And I think that, in some ways, is the brilliance of the River City Renaissance. You have that mass amount of money. You throw it into a package. You have to provide something for everyone because it's got to get through the Jacksonville City Council, okay? Your socialites, your people that want to bring good concerts to the city and, and have a place where you can step out and feel like you're you know, you feel like you're having your night on the town, right? You may have not gotten that from a 1960s era, era, 1960s era building, okay? But by the 19, 1990s, you know, you're feeling that, look, couldn't we have better, right? Couldn't, we're right here on the river, can we not do more? Times Union Center for the Performing Arts is what we get. And in the background, you can see the names of skyscrapers, how they've changed a little bit. You know, back then it was Bell South and first... How can you forget First Union? <laughs> okay, long time ago. Seems like a long time ago, but some people it isn't. But I don't know, sometimes it seems like a, a lifetime ago, but sometimes it seems like just yesterday, right? And it's amazing to see what really was pumped into the city to really enhance it, just as the Jaguars will come along in 1995. It's almost like, let's get things geared up, let's get things ready Let's get our facelift because we're going out for a night on the town nationally in 1995. Now, I want to talk a little bit about historical renovation because the city does have a legacy that should be recognized for that, okay? While the Jacksonville Terminal, a Union Station, uh, that was a railroad uh, station from 1919 uh, until uh, uh, 1974, and before that there was a, a depot that served a lot of trains, uh, starting, I believe, in the 1890s. And it ultimately burned down. What was left of it burned down in the 19, late 1970s. Uh, and so this terminal set abandoned for a long time. Uh, here we see it around 1982. And, you know, again, uh, we have these periods in Jacksonville history where people come along and go, let's build, let's do, we have a need, we have a function, let's do it big, let's do it right. And then things change, but then an idea emerges, a consensus emerges, right? Political leaders, business leaders, the people that can make things happen, get things through the city council, have those appropriate conversations, you know, and, and get out into the media. And what you get then, you get the Prime F. Osborne III Convention Center, where I had the chance to see with my family uh, Ramsey, the Ramsey's exhibit, and, uh, and I saw an, on, yes, a school field trip where, of course, I was on my best behavior. So let's look at the Ritz. I have a lot of passion about the Ritz because I remember what I saw 
in the 80s and the 90s. And uh, I knew, I, I, when I first saw it as a child and I saw that this was a grand place, even though at the time I was seeing it, it was long uh, abandoned, right? Uh, the sign, and incredibly, did, how can you forget the sign? And I think that was one of the great accomplishments to really keep the sign. And then, but other thing, everything else had to be basically reconstructed uh, for it. And ultimately, the big push was in the 1990s to go ahead and because basically there were areas of La Villa that had developed to be an eyesore. Okay, certain things, you know, as things changed, people moved away, um, neighborhoods changed, the theater itself. Uh, the outside of the theater, as you can see, this would be from the 1980s. This is what I would remember. Uh, and a lot of people had a lot of, uh, and I love the fact that in the 1990s that there was a plan to get this taken care of, to get dealt with, to recognize the heritage of the area, which had clearly, things were clearly wrong, right? And, you know, also, too, I mean, it should be kept in mind this is on one of the main thoroughfares going through the city, going from Arlington out to the beaches to 995. If you were going that route, you're going right by through. And the idea, I think, was to develop a kind of, and again, here we borrow from another city, okay? We borrow from Orlando. The idea, the concept of Church Street Station. This would be a phrase that resonates with people of the 70s and the 80s who grew up in Florida, who went down to Orlando. I've been to, I've been to Church Street Station. Absolutely fascinating. I think the idea was to try to develop something like that. And when you see a building like this, right, don't you think something like that could work? The building goes. We get the Urban League building. But you do see the Ritz sign right there, right? Uh, you know, the problem, I think, was... And, and it's, it was the, the last gasp of the really bad urban renewal ideas in some neighborhoods. And if the interstates didn't get a lot of these neighborhoods, uh, tragically flawed urban renewal plans that aren't, weren't put on a very rigid, hard timeline with things attached and say, we're going to do this, this, X, Y, Z, and that's going to be it. You know, now you see what we have, right? And, and listen, you've got a park across the way. I stood there to film. Uh, when I filmed about La Villa and Ritz, uh, I, I stood across uh, from right there and uh, facing out to where we're looking at where I would have been across the street where I would have been standing. I don't know. You have to have you have to have something there. You just can't have one building, right? It would have had to have been massive. You you and and I look at all of this and I go with River City Renaissance and I look at what I dreamed about. Because I read the newspaper and I, I was civically engaged. I was you can't get any more civically engaged. Civically engaged than someone who's at a community college, who's going all over the city, whether it's downtown campus, Kent campus, South Campus. I was all over the place in that little Toyota. And, you know, learning a lot about the city, going all these different places and in, in, in the nineteen nineties later on, I would. And you see that in general, in common, right, a lot of things can get accomplished. A lot of money got pumped into parks, libraries. You know, the idea, I think, also was after some of what people were seeing in the 80s, a lot of the drug problems, crack issue and all of that, there had to be something that would spur some development. And so one of the great things was the Ritz Theater that we did get. Another thing that Jacksonville got with the River City Renaissance plan was Jacksonville got a new city hall in a renovated St. James building, which uh, at one point had been uh, the Cohen Brothers department store, also called the Big Store, later on became May Cohen's. Uh, and we see it through the years. And uh, wow, you know, it, it, there are some great things that happen. It's just too bad that some of the energy that got put into the St. James building, or renovating it, making it better after May Cohen's left, and it sat there abandoned for a while, right? It's too bad some of that uh, intense effort maybe possibly could have just been put elsewhere, and then you hobble along with the old city hall, and then later on you go along and do something new. But if you look at how massive the building is, it's an amazing accomplishment, and it's something that should be remembered, and it should be recognized as something that was accomplished. But again, what are you looking for in common? There's some great things that can happen with La Villa, but those are, those are um, things that have to be done, you know, 
corner by corner, street by street, is looking at what we're looking at at this point. Um, the problems with what happened and what resulted are clear, and they've been understood for a while. This is from an article, uh, a 2010 article from the Times Union, and you can see where it, uh, it actually references the Duval County Courthouse under construction. Okay, you know, I mean, if you look at the construction of government buildings, right, <laughs> that's always taken care of. But I think that they need to start looking at making things better in all of the neighborhoods. But it takes people to do that. I think a big problem that the city had was they started condemning land. They started moving people off the land. Some of these people ended up in a place called the Ambassador Hotel. All right. Um, I'll tell you right now that life is a funny thing. And I think my trajectory in creating history videos were my experiences in the 1990s, which were very, very, I would say somewhat raw. You, you know, you grew up, you know, as a somewhat, let's just say I was a fluent white kid on the West Side, all right? And you see a city that you love and you see such great potential and you hear such great grand plans and then years go by and you see what you see and you have what you have as a citizen, right? I was a citizen of Jacksonville up to 2019 with some gaps, of course, from where I lived other places. Um... And so I leave you with these, these thoughts that there's a potential for more, right? There's a homeless center, a homeless shelter that was built uh, as part of the River City Renaissance. I think a lot of it was the River City Renaissance identified the issues, tried to go about to deal with them in the way that the politicians could in a market-oriented environment. What I'm talking about is civic atonement. And I think that the city, right, and other cities throughout the nation need to look geographically, economically, and I think it's time for some civic atonement, more civic atonement. And I think River City Renaissance and other plans were step forward, steps forward towards that. But I think when you go and you look around, you don't have to go downtown, you don't have to look at La Villa, you can look elsewhere. You can look off 103rd Street. You can look, you can look all over the place, and you can see where leadership's clearly needed. Um, and that's all I'm going to really say about that. And I, this has been a unique Jacks '94 for you. 1994 was an incredible year for me. I, I really got out into the city. I really got running around and about. And one of the places I went to was a festival called World of Nations at Metropolitan Park. And you get the chance when you're a community college to really uh, meet people uh, throughout the city. And it, just, uh, it was just an incredibly uh, fun time. And I think that I really came of age in the 1990s. And I can remember listening to Tom Petty on I-10, um, and then going across the Hart Bridge on the way over to uh, the South Campus at uh, FCCJ to uh, do academic competitions and driving over the Hart Bridge and listening to Green Day. So a great time because you're able to get out in the world and you're able to see a lot of the nitty gritty. And I hope that you got a lot of the nitty gritty in this one. Uh, this was a long one. This was Jack's 94. And uh, you can tell that I'm running out of time. I have Jack's 95 ahead for you. And that's going to finish the Jacksonville year by year series spanning 1975 to 1995. You're watching the end of show number 19 of the series. And of course, there's always History Jacksonville, which I completed a while back. That's 85 shows and four specials. I've talked a lot about the city because the city was my life. <clears throat> and uh, I moved to another city. I did that in 2019. And so I'm going to bring you Jackson 95. Then I'm going to bring you a special uh, commemorative presentation 
celebrating the 200th anniversary of the naming of Jacksonville uh, and the petitioning for it to be a port of entry for the United States of America through the Secretary of State in 1822. And then I'll have a, a final sign-off video. So I'm telling you a little bit about what's going on here on the channel. If anything, just to let you know that my time is running out and uh, I've enjoyed presenting all of this to you. Uh, and I'll have more to talk with you about JAX 95. Uh, uh, truly a, a great time for the city. So much going on. And if you could just somehow have encapsulated the optimism many people had in the 1990s about Jacksonville, uh, you'd probably solve the energy crisis. <laughs> all right. Well, I want to thank you all for uh, watching. Uh, and I want to invite you to please stay tuned uh, for Jax95. Take it easy. See you later.